Uh, for those of you new to New America Welcome, as you know, we're a non nonpartisan think tank and civic enterprise dedicated to the renewal of American politics um, and <coughs> in the digital age. Um, and I think, therefore, there's really no better conversation um, than to have this evening about governance in the digital age, internet governance, um, and the rules of the road, uh, and whether we need a digital Magna Carta. Uh, I'm particularly delighted this evening to be co-hosting this event with the Consulate General of, of Switzerland, Ambassador Bob Schaller and your colleagues. Thank you for coming, and thank you uh, for joining forces with us. Um, it's a real treat for us to be able to do this. Uh, and the discussion tonight will be um, led by Stefan Verhust. Welcome back, uh, Stefan, the um, philosopher king, I think, of internet governance um, uh, at the Gun Lab um, prior. That's excellent. Gun Lab at Pryor, um, head of internet governance at the Markle Foundation, um, and has been teaching on the subject for for six for, for more years than there we've had an internet. Um, but I'd love to hand off this evening welcome to um, Ambassador Schaller. Thank you very much, Georgia. Good evening, bonsoir, grüezi. Dear participants, together with my team from the Consulate General of Switzerland, I'm really delighted to be here tonight with you at the New America NYC and welcome you to this panel with leading experts on international on internet governance. Switzerland and the United States are close partners in innovation. Our two great countries rank amongst the top 10 in the latest global innovation index. And basis of that achievement is the use and creative development of the internet as part of the digital revolution. And we are just at the beginning. You know that better than I do. And the internet of things will offer many more exciting possibilities and opportunities. And we all know that opportunities do not come without risks. And that's where good internet governance comes in. The discussion on internet governance is at its start. It's still very fluid. And therefore, it's very timely and important that we exchange our views and our also experiences, best practices amongst partners. United States, Switzerland, European partners. And I'm eager to hear from you, remarkable group of speakers, your thoughts, your ideas, your exchange. From Switzerland, we have Dr. Jovan Kovalia with us. He will contribute to the exchange. He is founder of the Diplo Foundation, which is supported by the Swiss Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And he recently published a study, Switzerland and Internet Governance, which was commissioned by my ministry. At the same time, Jovan is the founder of the Geneva Internet Platform. Geneva is positioning itself as one international hub for internet governance. Let's not forget that it was in Geneva that the internet was invented by the British scientist Tim Berners-Lee at the uh, <laughs> at the CERN, the European Organization for Nuclear Research. I meant to introduce our, our moderator, Professor Stefan Verhulst, but he was already portrayed as the king of internet philosophers. So, without any further ado, I want to thank our partners, New America NYC, very much for teaming up for this event together with us. And please, do also enjoy the Swiss wine. Switzerland is about uh, innovation, but it's also about tradition, traditional Swiss hospitality. We usually call that high-tech and Heidi. So please do enjoy also <laughs> the Heidi. <laughs> now, Stefan, over to you for high-tech. <laughs> right. Thank, Thank you very much, Ambassador, for this uh, kind introduction and for a uh, enlightening positioning of uh, Switzerland. Uh, you know, we could go through a whole range of how Switzerland is known, ranging from the chocolate to the cheese, but now, of course, the internet uh, is, the, uh, uh, is one of the key uh, features that, uh, um, and especially the focus on internet governance is the key features that uh, positions 
uh, Switzerland and Geneva uh, on the map. And to a large extent, of course, it's to a large extent also thanks to uh, Jovan's efforts and the efforts especially around the Geneva internet platform that has uh, made this uh, uh, happen. Uh, today, we're going to try to uh, um, scratch the uh, uh, surface of uh, internet governance. And uh, as um, um, was already mentioned, I've been uh, teaching internet governance uh, at NYU for the last uh, seven years or so. And uh, each time at the beginning of class, uh, I ask my students, so what's up? Uh, what happened? And, uh, and seven years ago, uh, it was like a timid kind of exchange of, well, this happened this week and this happened that week. In the last few years, uh, it's an avalanche of, uh, 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 of mentionings and an avalanche of reporting backs on this happened this week. And so we see actually a steady increase of the importance and also the uh, uh, developments in uh, internet governance. If we look at what happened this week, for instance, we can already uh, point to several uh, events that happened uh, um, uh, across the globe, uh, meaning in the I just have here, thanks to Sam, who is sitting there, who is uh, also producing for us a weekly scan on internet governance. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, some of the headlines that we see here is that um, the Europeans uh, warn its uh, citizens that if they use Facebook, then they are not safe from the NSA. So that's clearly uh, mm -hmm. one development that uh, focuses on the safe harbor questions, which is a key question of internet governance. Um, in India, uh, a major uh, uh, decision was made by the Supreme Court uh, of India that looked at um, to what extent is it constitutional to block uh, internet uh, content and to what is it constitutional uh, to uh, even um, have some kind of a uh, protection uh, from uh, um, uh, law enforcement if you post uh, uh, information on the uh, uh, internet. Uh, there's a whole debate uh, in France, uh, and I've got to point to some of the, uh, and introduce some of the uh, uh, speakers here, to what extent it is scarier, whether you block terrorism uh, or whether you uh, actually allow terrorists to use uh, the internet, which is clearly an internet governance uh, issue, and as the debate is ongoing. There's an ongoing debate to what extent uh, you can actually bridge the global digital divide by having uh, global operators such as Google and Facebook develop infrastructure in Africa. And to what extent that actually would hamper uh, freedom of expression or to what extent it actually would uh, support access to the infrastructure. Uh, there was a whole debate in Manila to what extent you can actually protect intermediaries from li liability this week and led to the so-called Manila uh, manifesto with regard to internet, uh, uh, internet uh, liability. Uh, and so on and so on. So just a few examples to showcase that internet governance is alive and well uh, and that unfortunately uh, it's not only alive and well but it's also an area of growing tension. And it's an area of growing tension because we really don't have uh, a good understanding or a good uh, consensus around how to go about uh, some of the challenges that are presenting on a daily basis with regard to the internet. And that's why Tim Berners-Lee, who I just learned was Swiss, no, 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 okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who obviously worked in, uh, uh, in Geneva at CERN and developed the uh, World Wide Web, uh, why Tim Berners-Lee called for this digital ma uh, Magna Carta, and why others uh, are calling for a new social contract uh, for the internet, because there is this need to actually have a set of principles that could apply across those examples that I've uh, cited that were uh, examples that uh, just we happened this week. And so that's, to a large extent, what we're going to try to discuss today, which is what is internet governance and how is it evolving and do we need principles? How do we deal with this growing uh, medium that is becoming more and more global and is entering into legal jurisdictions that are different uh, than where the internet emerged, such as Switzerland and the US and the rest of uh, uh, the world? And to what extent um, do we actually really need uh, uh, new principles? And so these are some of the questions that we are going to explore uh, in a conversation mode. And the uh, partners that I have here, which are uh, uh, the best that you can have with regard to internet governance, 
uh, are uh, people that have worked on the issues for many years. And uh, I'm delighted to introduce uh, all of them. And so why don't I start at the end with uh, George Sadowski, who has been um, uh, a leader on uh, internet governance uh, for many years and uh, is currently uh, um, associated with the Internet Governance Forum, but especially is also known as a board member of ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Numbers and Names, and quite often synonym with Internet Governance to a large extent. And I think what we hope to do today is to actually indicate that it is broader than uh, ICANN and the domain names. Uh, but that I mean, we can have a whole debate about the mandate of ICANN, but the concept of internet governance obviously is broader. Then we have Constance Bommelard, uh, who is the uh, global policy um, rep person at uh, uh, the Internet Society, uh, and um, um, has also a long-standing history uh, uh, and, and passion on internet uh, policy, uh, initially at the uh, French government, but now uh, at the uh, um, uh, technical committee and is also uh, a um, person that has um, clear practice on uh, multi-stakeholdership, especially for the technical community within the OECD. Then we have uh, Jovan, of course, who already was introduced. Uh, but Jovan and I met uh, many years ago when he was uh, uh, founding uh, Diplo Foundation, which is uh, uh, one of the most innovative organizations that tries to look at how can you actually change the way we do uh, international affairs using technology and how does it, uh, how does foreign uh, policy making uh, um, change once we have actually technology. And then, of course, uh, became a uh, important uh, member of the internet governance community is mainly known, or the Diplo Foundation is mainly known for the great uh, uh, work that they produce that uh, uh, always has some kind of a graphical representation, uh, including uh, a house of uh, how you should think about uh, uh, internet governance, and uh, is also the author of the most uh, outstanding work on internet governance, uh, a book that uh, he published uh, a few years ago, and that now has several uh, translations. Uh, and uh, last but not least, uh, we have uh, Olivier from uh, uh, Fordham, uh, Foundation, uh, Fordham, Fordham University, where he is a uh, uh, professor uh, working on a variety of issues related with internet governance, both uh, global but also uh, uh, domestic here in the US, and is just uh, or has just finished a uh, paper on another important internet governance topic that happened here in the US, which is, of course, the whole net neutrality kind of uh, debate and ruling uh, of the uh, FCC. With that, uh, I hope I impressed you that we have a great panel here uh, and that we are ready to start. And I would like to start with um, a question that quite often is not posed in this debate, uh, because when we look at internet governance, uh, quite often we look at uh, the risk and the harms and the tensions of uh, internet governance. But to, I always feel that we have to go back to basic and really think in terms of um, what is the value of the internet and, uh, and what is successful around the internet. Much of the debate about internet governance is about what is unsuccessful and how to fix it. And so my question to the, uh, the panel here is um, what is particularly successful uh, with regard to the internet, and what is particularly worrying. And once we have that uh, established, then we can start looking at, so how should we go about it, right? How should we go about uh, protecting what is specifically successful and even promoting that? And how can we go about what is particularly worrying with regard to the internet today? And why don't I start with Constance? Uh, um, um, because Constance and the Internet Society just actually finished uh, a, a survey, not on that question, but also a survey with regard to actually why should we go and have internet governance as such. But Constance, so what is exciting about the internet today and what is worrying from your point of view? And then I would like to go to George, Jovan, and Olivier, and, uh, uh, and then uh, go to the next uh, uh, question. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think many things are, are exciting um, and one of the reasons why we're here today is probably to talk about the concerns. 
Um, you started the conversation uh, by saying that uh, there is an appetite for new principles um, and that the framework of the discussion today was about um, norms and principles. Um, I think perhaps we can start there. Uh, in, in one of the questions, you said, do we need new principles? Um, I would argue, and as you've just mentioned, we um, just conducted a, a major consultation, a survey on internet governance. Um, and interestingly, we saw that uh, the, the respondents, uh, instead of saying we need new institutions, we need new principles, they indicated that they needed more information to understand the internet governance ecosystem. Um, they also uh, pointed to specific threats, such as cybersecurity, but the, the primary appetite was really for additional information to better understand internet governance issues, uh, information to better participate to the institutional dynamics um, that are there to resolve uh, issues. Uh, so interestingly, I think this, uh, this, this question of principles, do we need new principles, um, that question I think is, is debatable. Uh, you also started the discussion by um, uh, mentioning the different kinds of interventions you have from your students. Um, I would say all the issues you have uh, raised actually relate to different sorts of principles. There are very high level principles, uh, human rights. Uh, there are best practices, norms, laws. All these uh, different types of principles are at a different level. Um, and then maybe I would add that um, I think the question is more on the applicability of existing principles uh, than necessarily rushing to creating new principles. Maybe we do need new principles, but, but certainly the first question should be how do we apply existing principles such as human rights to, uh, to, um, to the internet. The Human Rights Council a few uh, years ago um, in a very important resolution said absolutely uh, that uh, human rights needed to apply online as they apply offline. And a few weeks ago there was a, an important uh, conference at UNESCO that will feed into the WISIS process. Very interesting discussions. Not only human rights need to apply, but they need to be effectively respected online. Um, so again, I think the question of whether or not we need new principles uh, can, be, can be discussed. But that that um, was the question that will follow. Ab so, absolutely. And so, and I'm, and you're, you're I'm, sorry, I'm sorry for challenging so, that. I, I think you're very skilled in, in, in not addressing <laughs> the question. So, so, so what excites me? Why should we care? I mean, what's the, I mean, so if you would say, um, if you're in a conversation and say, well, well, we need internet governance, right? And so quite often it's about, because anyway, we want to prevent something, but what do we want to promote? I mean, so what is the, so George, why don't you go? Because I know this is quite often the question that is never posed, uh, and that's the reason why it's the hardest one in this panel probably. But George, why would you, okay. what, what would you say, like, why do we why do we care? I mean, what is so what is so exciting? What's the success story here that we should seek to uh, um, to uh, to promote? Thanks, Stefan. Uh, first, I want to say that everything I say tonight is not necessarily the opinion of anybody I've ever worked for, or or who has worked for me, <laughs> but it may be. We don't know. Uh, second, uh, uh, I've uh, spent a long time in this industry, and my brain is full at this point, so you'll understand if I occasionally look at my notes uh, to uh, remind me of the points that I want to make. Well, what's exciting? What's exciting is that half the world is on the internet. That's really exciting. Uh, and it's, been ta it's taken place in 20 years, and it's going to get better uh, with the advent of cell phone technology and greater cell coverage in areas where we've uh, normally not had the penetration rates, uh, South Asia, Africa, and so on. So that's terrific. Um, the second thing is to see the new business models come out. 
uh, who, the, uh, the ability to make life easier and to have new kinds of businesses form. Uh, my friends, when they want a taxi, they just hit the Uber button on their uh, cell phone. When they get to the airport, some of them don't even reserve hotels overnight. They get to the airport and they push hotel tonight and they decide where they're going to stay. And that, those are just two small examples of, of the way in which the internet and the services that are, that are exploding on the internet, especially on mobile, uh, are affecting our lives and much for the better. Um, there's a third thing which I think trumps both of those, and that is that now it's possible for everybody who's on the internet to have what is essentially an increasingly level playing field with regard to access to knowledge. Uh, I did a lot of work in Africa in the 70s and the 80s. When I went to a university library, it fit on two bookshelves that didn't go above this height, uh, and the books were 20 years out of date, uh, and, uh, and was, that was typical. Now, with the internet, uh, we have the possibility of teaching people how to go after the knowledge they need when they need it and to find out what they need at the same time to create linkages with people in other countries who can help them. This is a major, uh, uh, a major step toward uh, increased rate of development. Now what worries me? What worries me is that um, uh, it's all about malicious misuse. Uh, Vince Cerf said at one point that uh, the internet was uh, a laboratory experiment that escaped the laboratory. It was, it was done among friends. Everybody who was on the internet was a friend. And so security was not an issue. And we are paying for that in spades right now, retrofitting things, trying to introduce a culture of security among the internet users, which now number half the world. Remember, that's a lot of people. Uh, and uh, uh, the issue is, is and, and I think the cyber criminals are ahead. Uh, I, don't, I think we need to catch up. I don't think we're putting enough of an investment in it uh, by any means. Uh, the uh, the uh, sentences that people are getting are out of proportion to the, the damage that they are causing in the aggregate um, among people who are affected. Uh, and uh, what can I say? It's a... Uh, uh, one of the problems with this is that to the, if we can't solve the cybercrime or the malicious use uh, 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 problem by ourselves with the current institutional structures of the internet, uh, the um, governments of the world are likely to want to take it over and multi-stakeholderism will be under a very drastic challenge from multilateralism. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Um, Jova, what excites you about and why do we care? Well, uh, Stephen, I think it's, it's good that you started with this question because we sometimes we tend to take it for granted uh, what the Internet brought to the society. It's definitely a great enabler. But I think the, beside the, the great facilities that George uh, mentioned, uh, we have to care because of our uh, dependence on the Internet. We depend as a society, as individuals, and as organizations on the Internet. And, the, and it, is, it is basically main main concern. You mentioned your students, and I can recall what's, uh, what's my story of the, uh, of the increasing interest for the internet. When in 2004 I tried to explain to my friends what I was doing as uh, the working group on internet governance, which George yeah. and I belong, they usually called me to fix their printer or to install a <laughs> software. That was, that was maximum. They said, yeah. you do something with the printers and I don't have a paper or toner. I said, okay. I was usually, usually participating in that exercise. Then uh, five years later, the, some parents started asking about filtering for their kids. Now, as you can see, I lost my voice uh, because I had uh, yesterday three presentations. Uh, today I had uh, quite a few meetings and we had a big Asian tour trying to explain what the internet is about and how, what Ambassador mentioned, how to balance tradition and uh, innovation. And I will just uh, answer this, my concern with, uh, with two metaphors. Since we cannot use the PowerPoint and drawings, which is good, I am against use of PowerPoint. Uh, that's great. Okay. First metaphor is uh, uh, my visit to the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. Yesterday I went to, in Washington to visit the Supreme Court. And uh, I don't know how many of you uh, are aware of this fascinating uh, uh, bronze door with eight palettes, eight uh, basically depicting the main developments in the history of law from the ancient Greek, uh, Greece, uh, Rome, Magna Carta up to, up to our days. And then when you, st when you st uh, stand in front of that door, which is really fascinating by itself, you start thinking, 
about uniqueness of our, of our time. And, and obviously, we live in this time and era, and we are excited. It's, we think it's the best time, the most exciting. It's natural, but then you get a bit humble, and you realize that this court, US court, and uh, our predecessor were addressing more or less similar issues throughout the history. And uh, what was fascinating on that palette the, describing the Magna Carta, you had King George, King John, I'm sorry, and the Baron basically standing next to each other, King George putting the royal stamp on the Magna Carta, and Baron standing with his sword on the other side. And that, that image is really telling. It tells quite a few messages for our time, for, and for digital Magna Carta. It is basically, it was balance of power. It was a matter of the trade-off between uh, King John and Barons. And I think this is the first message that we can get from that, that door. Then on my way from Washington to New York, I heard about, about this tragic event on, in, uh, in uh, France, the, the crash of the German, German Wings airplane. And again, the door was the key. And that door worried me more than the, the great door on the US Supreme Court. Because one solution which was introduced by this special lock, the doors, to prevent the terrorists from coming into the cockpit, created a problem as well. In this case, with the tragic consequences. I think in that second door is probably a great lesson for the internet. Uh, and what basically worries me that we may uh, create new problems by finding uh, solutions for the immediate problems. And that's, that's a great concern. Uh, we have to handle with great care and net neutrality discussion is, is definitely one of the examples how messy internet governance is and internet policy. And we have to be humble. We have to handle the whole policy issues with great care. Therefore, this is basically the, I'm, the most Im impressive metaphor which I gathered over the last two days, one, one really great historical metaphor of the door of the US Supreme Court, and the other one, which is uh, rather tragic, but great. telling for our discussion on internet governance. Great. Olivia? Oh, well, I want to uh, thank uh, the organizers for having me. Uh, I feel like an outsider for a conversation that's been going on between uh, people for a while. But, but to, be, to be clear, though, I have been thinking about this for a while. Um, uh, and uh, I, I, I appreciate um, I, and, and, and agree with many of the comments that uh, others have made. Um, I mean, in terms of the promise, and the great wonder that the internet has brought, um, I think about a statistic like the one George gave with regards to um, the internet's ability um, as an inanimate thing to have brought other people in the conversation um, regards to policy, um, cultural production in ways that were not possible maybe before. Um, so that is, that is certainly um, the great promise. Uh, and this story about Africa and, and Facebook and Google's recent interventions, uh, zero rating uh, phones is, is on the one hand promising, but on the other hand, this is what I'm also concerned about and I expect we'll talk about. Um, and that is that uh, there are so many uh, people that remain, um, uh, that do not have the full range of affordances um, so uh, the Africans uh, in sub-Saharan Africa who are getting cell phones and mainly access the internet through mobile and wireless devices clearly do not have the range of affordances that those of us here do. And um, for me, this is a central challenge. Um, and I think really removes the internet from this exceptional category where you know, we have this fascination with the internet as this thing that makes us different from the past. But in truth, it's one of these resources that we're fighting over for the same problems with regards to distri distribution of good and resources. So, uh, great, great, thanks. And so, um, now that we have established some kind of value proposition, I think, uh, which is always the first thing that one should do when when thinks about governance, because otherwise, if you start with the risk, you might end up in a closed door kind of environment. Um, um, the question is, of course, well, what are the kinds of principles that guide to how you go about protecting the value proposition, or dealing with the risk that are real and that were expressed uh, as well. And so clearly we started off by saying that uh, some indicate that there is a need for a new Magna Carta, which basically spells out the principles of how, we, how to go about uh, the balance 
uh, of power to a large extent, but also how to go about the, uh, uh, the way to address certain kinds of issues. Um, but to a large extent, many of us who have been part of this environment uh, have been on this quest for principles for a while now. Uh, I mean, I still remember in 2012, which was labeled the year of the principles of uh, yeah. internet governance. I mean, we had the OECD uh, trying to come up with principles as they did. Uh, we had the UN looking into kinds of principles. And we had every kind of organization that was working on internet governance contributing to this debate about principles. So my question uh, um, to uh, the panel uh, is, uh, do we actually still need new principles? Or do we have principles that uh, we can build upon, or is there another problem, i.e. we have principles, but somehow we cannot find consensus enough to really build upon those principles. And so uh, the question, uh, uh, and Constance, you started, <laughs> I don't want to put you at the, at the spot again, uh, 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 but you already s sort of answered that uh, question, uh, um, but perhaps you might answer the question, do we, anyway, do we actually still need new principles? Um, and if so, what is missing today? Uh, why don't you start and reflect and, and build upon what you started off? OK, absolutely. Um, well, I, I think I, I, I started a little bit uh, earlier uh, with this uh, reflection around the idea that uh, we already have existing principles. And maybe the challenge today is to find how to apply them effectively. Uh, perhaps we will reach uh, a, a point where we will decide that we, we need new principles. Uh, but my intuition at this point is that uh, we are rather in a process where groups, institutions, the Human Rights Council, WIPO, UNESCO, the different um, entities in charge of applying and developing principles are adapting to the new era of the Internet. Um, it seems a little early to uh, rush to the conclusion, although perhaps we will get there, that we necessarily need new principles. Um, if, if you allow me to, I would like to bounce a little bit on, on the, uh, th this image that uh, Jovan um, uh, described earlier on, on openness and on this idea of, of, of door, because openness is one of the very important principles of the Internet. It's a principle, it's a technical principle, that has allowed the internet to flourish very rapidly, uh, but it's also a governance principle. Uh, and here there is something new that perhaps we need to build or uh, enrich or strengthen. It is uh, how we organize the principles in terms of participating to discussions. Um, you, you know that at the end of 2015, at the end of this year, there will be the 10-year review of the World Summit on the Information Society. The WISIS proposed important principles on how to organize the information society. Um, over the past 10 years, the technology has evolved. The way people use the internet has also changed. And the question is, how do we involve these people in the discussions uh, that will happen? Right. Uh, something very important um, in, in my view, the WISIS is organized by the UN. It's a UN process. Can you explain the WISIS? The World Summit on the Information Society. Um, that uh, was the first phase was held in um, Geneva in 2013, the second in Tunis. Um, and we have this year organized at the level of the General Assembly, the UN General Assembly, the 10-year review process. And one of the critical questions for our community is whether or not we will be allowed to participate to the negotiations. We know internet governance, the definition of internet governance is about involving all the relevant stakeholders, not just governments. And for us, the critical question will be, will we will be allowed to participate to the discussions? Great. Um, Olivier, do we need your principles? <coughs> well, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a fine question. Um, I, 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 let me answer it in two different ways. One as a, uh, you'll forgive me, I'll, I'll, I'll play more of a, I guess this is a professorial approach, but, but the, the question is, well, it, it's an interesting question only because I think people are seizing on this technology as an opportunity to assert that we need new principles or that we need to reaffirm old principles, right? Um, and in which case I would say, uh, depending on the audience, right, I would say, yes, we, we need to articulate these principles loudly and firmly, free speech, 
privacy, um, security, uh, whereas these have always been things we care about. Uh, so I agree with Constance on the one hand. I think, though, that this technology presents us with an opportunity. Um, right. Jovan? Well, um, we did recently some analysis of the number of the principles that you have currently. There are 18 different sets of principles. And even we contributed with one set of principles. So uh, I don't think, uh, well, 18th uh, one, uh, Geneva, Geneva message on internet governance. There, there is inflation a bit of, uh, of the principles. And then you know how it works with inflation. Whenever you have inflation, inflated object, object is reducing in its importance. And more or less, those principles repeat a uh, few similar lines, openness, inclusiveness, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. I don't think that we will need uh, new principles. Uh, uh, they, will, they will be settled somehow. What I'm seeing as a, a sort of a complementing process is a, a, a reaction of the country's population to the challenges of internet governance. European Court of Justice had recently two, had a hearing on Facebook yesterday and had right to be forgotten judgment last year, which is the major one. Therefore, people are trying to find a solution, and they are, uh, they are losing patience with the discussion on principles. Now, I think that this uh, dynamics, time-wise, it will be very, very interesting. And I'm afraid that uh, there will be a rush for the concrete solutions, and the general discussion about pr principles may lose its importance. That sort of general, again, I'm putting my professor professorial uh, hat and, uh, uh, and uh, making that, that distinction. Definitely we don't need a new principle. There are existing principles. We need to codify what already exists. And uh, they will emerge through this interplay. It won't be the Magna Carta where the King John of the digital era will put his royal seal or will sign the agreement. It will just emerge out of the, out of the practice which is happening in, with China, with Europe, with the United States, and the other countries. If, if you can forgive yeah. me, George, um, I, I would want to, want to say something about this, and I think it's a, it's a very uh, nice point that Jovan makes, that is sometimes these principles that matter really make themselves clear after we've done the hard work of formulating the, solving the problems, right? So multi-stakeholderism, multi for example, um, is the sort of thing, the sort of word that people use now to talk about internet governance, but, and maybe George can correct me if I'm wrong, but there, when, when this sort of thing was being discussed, it wasn't called multi-stakeholderism, right? It was just, just representation, yeah. participation. Um, so as a matter of principles, I think we'll know what they are right. the more we work at it. Right. Well, George, you want to go on the principles before we go to the multi-stakeholder? Yeah. <laughs> it's all yours. Yeah, okay. Principles. Uh, uh, right. Uh, Multi-stakeholder is, isn't a, a principle, Olivier. It's now a religion, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I was confused by the practicing. Uh, well, uh, practicing people from the religion. Uh, we'll well, convert them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the conversion ceremony is. Um, the uh, um, let's see. I was confused by the term Magna Carta, but it clearly was successful. It brought you all here. Uh, it's a lousy analogy. Uh, and the better analogy is a constitutional convention, because we're really spending a long time. We're not, un unless you wish to be the king who has the seal, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, we're really dealing with some pretty fundamental issues here, both on the internet and off. Uh, and uh, they're, they're fairly weighty. And it's going to take a long time, just like constitutional conventions do. Um, we have lots of sets of principles. In addition, we have all the holy books, the Bible, the Koran, uh, all, all of the great documents of history. Uh, we don't need any more flying over the landscape at 50,000 feet, looking down and saying, oh, here are the basic ideas. There's privacy, uh, there's access, there's, uh, there's intellectual property, and so on. We have done that. We have done that ad nauseum. Uh, what we need is a way of understanding internet governance better, understanding what the issues are that can be worked on, implemented, and, and according to those principles, and get the implementation done. Now, in order to understand that, we have to understand internet governance a little better. Uh, if you read Jovan's excellent uh, uh, document that he presented to the uh, Swiss government, Ambassador, you've got your money's worth, uh, you'll find a <laughs> Thank you, George. Uh, you'll, you'll find Jovan's picture of internet governance. That's a building that looks like it's falling apart, but not really, and there are people on ladders doing things, building the structure. If you looked at the PowerPoint slides that I wanted to show you tonight, but couldn't, uh, we have a, 
an analysis by David Souter, uh, an Englishman who's a very good student of internet governance, where he has these six basic areas laid out, but then in the next slide, you overlay what the real issues are, and there are something like 70 or 80 of them. And then you overlay that, you overlay that with the people who are concerned with the problems, and you overlay that with the institutions that think they have something to say with the problems, you will be confused. It's a confuse because the internet is mirroring real life, and that's what you, that's what we're looking at—a picture of real life. Now, there's one distinction that's worth making, and and I commend it to you uh, uh, above any other one, and that is governance of the internet versus governance on the internet. Governance of the internet means keeping the packets flowing. Governance of the internet is a technical thing, um, by and large. Governance of the internet demands, ex uh, uh, demands that you obey fundamental principles of physics, electronics, um, all the rest, the sciences. Uh, governance on the internet refers to problems which have existed prior to the internet, but which have taken new forms and migrated to the internet. And that's m almost all of human behavior at this point. Um, so the, the, the litmus test is, did this problem exist before the internet? If the answer is yes, it's governance on the internet. And, and that's the domain of policymakers. It's really the domain of citizens, generally. If it didn't exist before the internet, then it's governance of the internet. The problem comes when policymakers try to solve general policy problems by saying, oh, this is, this is a problem of governance of the internet. And therefore, if we make a technical change, rather than understanding what the, what the problem really is and how we, uh, the various methods of solving it, uh, that'll, that'll solve our problem. And I'll mention three right now. And by the way, uh, Leslie Daigle just authored a paper in the CG series, CIGI number seven, which really has a wonderful analysis of this, and I recommend it. But the three areas are, um, Putting national borders on the internet. It doesn't work with the technology. Uh, making um, IP addresses country-based. It violates certain, certain rules of the technology. Data localization, making sure your data are in your cloud in your country. All of these th things can be done with the internet, but not without wrenching them, wrenching some of the principles of the internet apart and, uh, and, and providing problems uh, in the future. OK, let me stop there. Great. Well, that was a, a great uh, um, distinction of some of the uh, some of the issues. Now, uh, I do want to come back to the religion that you uh, pointed out, and uh, to a large extent, I feel like guilty of uh, being part of the initial creation of the religion when, um, at the Marco Foundation, we were part of something called the Digital Opportunity Task Force, uh, which was a task force for the G8 uh, when uh, uh, the G8 had its. Uh, 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 when Japan was uh, 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 in charge of the G8, and I think that was in 1999. And they created a, a task force, and uh, George knows it very well, it was uh, which was aimed to bridge the global digital divide. And the, uh, uh, the an innovation of the task force was to actually bring the different sectors to the table, i.e., in that context was civil society, industry, and government. And the real innovation was that everyone would have an equal vote with regard to how to address and how to go about the, uh, 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 the uh, global digital divide. And it was a very successful uh, undertaking, led to a, a, a series of commitments by both industry, civil society, and uh, uh, government to start overcoming uh, the digital divide. And it was also the first time when really what was called at that time multi-sectoral governance uh, was tested in the space. Now, the UN at that time, uh, which had no uh, uh, internet governance agenda, uh, became concerned about the ICT, and the Secretary General, Kofi Annan at that time, uh, started something called the UN ICT Task Force. And the UN ICT Task Force was really an attempt by the UN to uh, start looking at who in the UN is actually working on ICT, and how can we then also address the concerns of digital divide. And they started, and they looked at the digital uh, um, task force, the global, the, the GDOI, or GDOP, whatever, uh, GDOP, uh, digital opportunity task force. And they said, 
that model of multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral, is a model we should follow for the UNICT, and that's how ultimately multi-stakeholdership was somewhat born in the context of the uh, internet governance, which then led to the World Summit, uh, which was uh, initially hosted by uh, Switzerland, where they did an attempt to actually uh, replicate some of the multi-sectoral representation. And now, of course, we have multi-stakeholdership as being the model of going about uh, internet governance. But the concern is exactly as was already raised on, on said occasion, is that it has become a mantra to a large extent for going about the uh, solving the problems. And while the principles of participation and the principles of making sure that those who are affected actually take part are of course principles that are essential to democracy and essential to good governance, uh, multi-stakeholder confuses some of that. And so the question that I have to the panel here is not to anyway, fully critique, but is to say, uh, what should we do right, to actually make uh, um, governance of the internet uh, um, responsive to those that actually are affected by the decisions uh, that are being made. And multi-stakeholder is quite often being suggested as the solution. It could be the solution, but how should we go about this? And Jovan, I know you have been thinking about that a lot, and of course the Geneva Internet Platform to a large extent was created to bring around the uh, parties that are affected and have a stake to a large extent. Uh, but so how, how should we go about uh, uh, making sure that internet governance is inclusive uh, and uh, to a large extent uh, um, um, provides for the different stakeholders to uh, be uh, uh, play role. Sure, well, as it was indicated, it is becoming mantra, ideology or religion, and uh, basically you have to decide if you are uh, on one side multi-stakeholder and on the other side of, let's say, scope with intergovernmental group, basically, more or less. And I think it is very dangerous and very risky, and this is the reason why during the Geneva Internet Conference in November last year, uh, we tried to bring uh, some sort of Swissness into discussion, which means a practical approach, analysis, and uh, uh, we tried, I would say, quite successfully to decompose the concept of multi-stakeholder approach and see what are the building blocks. And as you indicated, it is inclusion, it is check and balances, transparency, subsidiarity, and other elements. Uh, Multi-stakeholder approach uh, has been um, quite successful um, in the internet governance so far. It has been, certain challenges are, are obvious, especially since internet is becoming uh, uh, more relevant for the, uh, more relevant as a public utility. Therefore, one way is to uh, decompose the mantra and to say what is useful, what works, what doesn't work, how it can uh, increase the inclusiveness, democratic principles of modern society, and other related core values of, of, of modern society. This is, I would say, I would say one, one approach that we should, uh, should follow. The other, which we can call it the diverse geometry, is that in some fields, uh, some players and some actors should have the leading role. For example, in the field of cybersecurity or fight against cybercrime, uh, we, it's in a way natural to have the leading role of governments. Therefore, we cannot apply the same uh, sort of multi-stakeholder um, uh, criteria for the all internet governance issues. When it comes to infrastructure governance of the internet, multi-stakeholder related to ICANN issues and related issues has been proven as a successful method. But in other fields, cybercrime, cybersecurity, we may have a slightly, slightly different model. Therefore, those are two principles in order to advance discussion. One is to decompose the mantra and to see what is what works, what doesn't work, and second, to use diverse uh, geometry and to see where multi-stakeholder approach can be effectively utilized. Great. Anyone wants to? Um, sure, I'm, I'm, I'm happy yeah. to, to add a little bit on, on that. I think absolutely multi-stakeholderism is not a principle. Transparency is a principle. Accountability, openness are principles. Um, first of all, multi-stakeholder uh, multi-stakeholderism, um, I think we need to understand that you have various forms. Sometimes it's about consulting stakeholders. Sometimes it's about decisions on an equal footing. Those are two different things. Um, when, I, when I look at the role of um, multi-stakeholderism, and when, when we say it's been a mantra, yes, perhaps, perhaps we need to go beyond and recognize that 
It should not be, a, it's not a principle, it's simply a methodology. Um, this said, I do think that um, the central role it has played in uh, people's discourse has been useful because over the past 10 years, the different stakeholder communities have really learned to work together. Uh, 10 years ago, the working habits to collaborate public-private partnerships in this field were less natural. And I think we've, re we've reached a stage today where because we have this community of experts uh, with people from all different sorts of, of stakeholder communities, they do effectively work together. So the mantra has had a, a very useful role, and perhaps today it's time to go beyond. Great. So um, and, uh, one last question, and then we're going to go and uh, open it up for uh, uh, using the principle of openness, uh, open up the, uh, uh, the floor here. But uh, so, so uh, George started off by saying that part of the success story is exactly the amount of people that are connected to the uh, internet. And so we have around 2 billion plus uh, internet users these days. But uh, clearly, the next 5 billion uh, are being uh, uh, are located in um, countries that are non-Western countries uh, that uh, quite often are coming from a different uh, legal jurisdiction uh, and are quite often not part of the current uh, decision-making uh, uh, process. Um, so the question uh, that I have is that how do we anticipate um, making internet governance more global uh, if that is a need? Uh, because that might be a constant pressure uh, as we have more and more uh, people joining uh, the internet community coming from countries that traditionally were not part of the, uh, uh, of the debate. And so concretely that of course is reflected in ICANN and uh, we don't have to go there, uh, which of course is a big debate about how can we make ICANN more global, which is currently being debated, but it applies to uh, uh, many other uh, fora. And, um, and um, I see George has a clear opinion about that. So why don't we start with you, George, and, uh, uh, and then uh, what's your reaction to that uh, uh, positioning? Well, I have several reactions. First of all, um, this happens all the time in internet governance uh, discussions. Internet governance somehow gets equated either totally or partially with ICANN. And it I didn't just, want to do that. I mean, that was, uh, that was not my just, intent, but it's, it happens just, to be a debate now. It is dead wrong. Yeah. It is dead wrong. If you look at Jovan's building, or, uh, or David Souter's uh, uh, diagram, or Constance's uh, ISOC diagram, uh, the infrastructure, it, governance of the internet is about one-tenth of it. And governance on the internet is about nine-tenths, because that, that deals with social problems, social issues. And, and, and the, the issue about what do we do about internet governance is, or what do we do, sorry, what do we do about multi-stakeholders and how do we regard multi-stakeholderism is not a valid question unless you say governance of what? You're starting with a means and not an end. What's the problem? Given a problem statement, then you can go to is multi-stakeholderism the, uh, the best way of solving it? And Constance brought up a very valid point. There are different flavors of multi-stakeholderism. Uh, which is the right flavor for this? Who should the stakeholders be? Do I really want uh, any arbitrary group to be a stakeholder on how the packets are, are run from one place on the internet to the other? No, I don't. Uh, I want that to be limited. Uh, do I want, when I take my bus home to Vermont uh, tomorrow, uh, do I want the, uh, the way in which the bus is run to be a multi-stakeholder decision? No, I don't. I want the bus driver to drive the bus. Uh, let's start with goals. The goals in, 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 that I see in terms of internet governance are, of, on, of the internet, let's make sure it technically works. Let's make sure there's no roadblocks to the extent we can, to the extent that national sovereignty concerns don't enter in with, the, with censorship. Let's make sure that things work. Uh, with respect to governance on the internet, uh, let's take cybercrime. Let's make sure that our judicial system knows how to deal with, uh, uh, with electronic uh, preservation of evidence. Let's make sure that judges understand uh, uh, how, to, uh, how to judge these cases. Let's make, sure that, let's make sure that all functions of the judicial uh, apparatus of government function well in cyberspace as well as they do outside of space, so, cyberspace. And that's true with respect to every one of these areas uh, uh, with respect to governance on the internet. For, for the most part, for 
forget ICANN, for the most part, forget the uh, getting the packets from here to there. Let's solve the societal problems. And I think this is, uh, this is what I think, Olivia, you mentioned, that, that uh, the internet is a, a way to revisit issues that have, been, that have been with us for some time, but now appear in a new context. Uh, and uh, it's time for us to address them and solve them. And that's not done at the 50-foot level, 1,000-foot level. That's done on the ground. Thank you. Great. Olivier, a uh, quick reaction to the globalization of, um, uh, of the internet and whether that has an impact on how we go about governing. Um, well, um, I mean, I'll, I'll start by saying let's just assume that the internet is not different. And um, if it isn't different and we have to disaggregate it and think about the different problems that arise, it, it looks much more like um, all the other resources that um, interested groups fight over. And if that's true, and we have conventions to resolve these problems, why aren't we considering them? Um, and this is a touchy question, right? I mean, part of the reason it's touchy is because uh, we, many of us in the West value the purported technological principles on which the internet is based, openness, for example. Um, but these are now political questions. And and uh, how do we resolve that? I mean, that's a tough, that's a challenging problem, particularly since so much of the world is not yet persuaded that openness is necessarily uh, an important value. I think there are fora for that. And, and the fora for that are, are, are uh, things like the United Nations. Uh, I know that that's, I mean, that in a, in, a, in, a, in a world where there is some real resistance to thinking that technological questions should be left to the United Nations, but there are spaces for that, um, and I, I take up the uh, metaphor that um, George uh, mentions about the bus, although I want you to get home safely, uh, <laughs> to be sure, um, uh, but bus drivers are licensed, uh, and those are decisions that states make. Uh, uh, um, the pilots uh, on the airplane that Jovan uh, mentioned, um, these are questions about how pilots are certified, uh, and those are questions that nation states make, um, those are not questions that pilots, apart from the conventional rulemaking, lawmaking processes make. Nor, nor do I think many of us want that. Um, Great. So let's open up. And, uh, uh, there might be a question. So why don't we start at the back? <coughs> do we have a mic? Uh, just shout out. Shout out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's being webcast, so you need to. I will repeat the question. Right. Okay. So as we move forward, and there is some type of internet governance, uh, the, my question is, what direction of balance do you see between basically voluntary, uh, you know, adhesion to principles that a internet governing bodies would, would set up, as opposed to mandatory or technical solutions from which basically there is no effective. Uh, you know, opportunity to uh, go against them. So the question, as I understand okay. it, is, <laughs> is to what extent um, do you see, the, on the one hand, the preference for voluntary uh, rulemaking and uh, enforcement versus mandatory uh, uh, imposing uh, kind of rules that uh, the internet uh, community should um, uh, follow. Does anyone want to, Jova, are you going to address that? Maybe on very concrete example, which is data protection and privacy. Just not to have the abstract, abstract. We have two possibilities. One possibility is to have proactive self-regulation by, in this case, internet industry. Or if it is uh, missing, uh, then uh, there is a reaction by courts, international organization, and other players. And this morning, the UN uh, uh, Human Rights uh, 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 Council adopted the resolution, I would say historical resolution of introducing a special rapporteur in the UN terminology, it is important, but it is basically body and person who can go to a specific country and check the level of the privacy protection, data protection, and other issues. This was established this morning. He will be nominating over the next few months. If you have one position is to have the self-regulation according to the certain principle, in this case, of privacy protection, or if it is missing, then you have reaction of international organization, in this case, the Human Rights Council, or uh, what is happening increasingly in Europe of the 
of the European courts. And this, it is interesting development because Europeans still trust the courts. They don't trust politicians, generally speaking, but with the exception of Switzerland, I would say. But in many European countries, <laughs> I mean, many European countries, they, they basically don't trust politicians, but they trust courts. And they, they address their issues to the European courts, European courts of justice, in the case of right to be forgotten, now in the case of the Facebook and the safe harbor ag agreement. Therefore, this is in a way a balance. And I can notice that internet industry, at least based on the discussion they had over the last two weeks, is realizing that if they want to create a sustainable business model, they have to take into consideration these concerns of privacy and data protection. General mantra is the less privacy protection, better for the new business model where the data can be mined and the profit can be made. But now there is a shift towards a more sustainable business model and uh, attempt to take into consideration privacy and human rights right. concerns. Right, so I, I actually wrote a book once on uh, internet self-regulation. And uh, after 300 pages, I came to the conclusion that it works when there is a carrot and a stick. Uh, yeah. And the, the most important stick in internet self-regulation is actually the shadow of government. Uh, the fact that government <laughs> might step in uh, uh, at a certain point in time actually made self-regulation happen and also made actually this whole concept of free ridership uh, limited. And so you do actually need both uh, in place to a large extent, you need an interest from government and you do also need to have an interest uh, by uh, corporations if they want to uh, uh, adhere to certain kind of self-regulatory principles to actually comply and, uh, uh, um, and adhere to them. Um, yeah, next question. Uh, and, then, and then here in, in front, so yeah. And, 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 um, Pose a question, right? So, uh, yeah. and I know, Shivini, you, you would I always pose a question. It's an open meeting. Uh, it's an open meeting. Then, then you can focus on what you're in the camera, please. So, no, it's okay. It's a quick question. Uh, when we talk about governance, uh, you understand that in many countries this term doesn't exist as in their language, governance. But also, um, in the European context, Johan was both in the European court, and it's uh, understandable. You live in Europe. The court is respected, but the European laws regulate only stuff which is uh, dangerous for the life or the health, basically. I mean, everything else is more or less loose. But what would be your thinking, and maybe George should be the one to respond, actually, because you came with the two t different uh, governance, earth and governance on, which makes it even more complicated to translate it in, say, <laughs> Bulgarian or Russian. But what, what do you think would be the right balance on regulating what do, is there a need for a regulation at all Thank you. well yeah, when, uh, go ahead. when I was working on the Gippy project 15 years ago, the, uh, uh, one of the comments that the CDC folks said uh, was if you go to a developing country and if you meet a regulator and you ask him what his job is, his job is to regulate. And therefore, if any, something new comes along, his job is to regulate it. So the issue is why regulation? And that's an issue going back to the goals. What do we want to accomplish by regulation? So that there's, no, there's no good answer to that outside of a context a specific substantive context. Um, so I'm going right back to uh, George Sadowski's uh, um, point in the beginning where he was so excited about his company, so like, uh, like Uber that you mentioned and others. And I share your excitement from a consumer perspective, right? But now over the last uh, few months, I guess we also learned that basically uh, certainly hundreds of thousands of workers on the other side of the equation are affected by that by global consolidation by companies like Uber, of this whole sector, uh, by Amazon, Mechanical Turk, by Crowdflower, crowdsourcing industry, mm -hmm. all of that actually creates quite miserable conditions for workers worldwide. Well, there are of shades to that, right? It's different yeah. in India than it is in the United States. But nevertheless, uh, so like, why is that never an issue? Why are labor issues, labor concerns, not an issue in a t at a time when uh, companies like Amazon and Google act increasingly like labor companies. So why is I, I, it seems to me that you're pressing. I think it is an issue, but um, others might have a different perspective. Now, I think that's part of the challenge of, the, of internet governance, is that, uh, as uh, uh, Jovan said, I mean, to a large extent, uh, we've moved into a dependency 
uh, 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 relationship with the internet and is being used for healthcare, it's being used for uh, uh, digital labor, it's being used for a variety of other uh, uh, practices, daily practices, and as a result, the aspect of internet governance has boomed to a large extent because now it has to also deal with actually healthcare issues because it, uh, it impacts healthcare. It has to uh, deal to a large extent with labor issues because it impacts labor. And of course, there is a whole debate that uh, how far do you go, right? And to what extent is it essential to internet governance? But uh, you cannot ignore it. And, and I think that's uh, becoming more and more of an issue. But Jovan, uh, I'm sure you have somewhere a graphic that uh, uh, explains mm. the, uh, I'm the entry point of labor into... Uh, but into probably the ultimate fight in the, on the internet governance <laughs> battle, whatever we call it, is uh, that could be idea for the one panel here. Uber versus taxi drivers. You know, Uber is a fast-growing company. Taxi drivers, at least in my part of the, of the, the world, are very interesting uh, part of society, social group. They are, they are social networkers by nature. They're in gray zone between uh, criminal milieu, uh, politics, economy. And if uh, Uber manages, for example, in the Balkans to win the battle against taxi drivers, then I think that battle is won on the, on the, on the global, global level. As a matter of fact, we are organizing panel in Geneva with taxi drivers and philosophers. And we are inviting the representative of the Uber discussing the deeper social issues that, that you raise, the question of labor, the question of taxation, the question of the uh, uh, utilitarian aspect. Therefore, around that question, taxi drivers versus Uber will have a quite a few core issues uh, related to internet governance in broader sense, not, uh, not uh, Internet governance uh, of uh, not governance of the internet, but governance on the internet. Labor issues, economic taxation, uh, standardization, you name it, and you have it. So Olivier, you have a response, and then uh, George has a response, and then I suggest we uh, uh, enjoy the Swiss wine that uh, uh, was brought and, and have the discussion uh, uh, going on. But somebody has to get up and say the emperor has no clothes, and 60%. I presume you're going to do that. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, exactly. If you do it, <coughs> frankly, 60% of the people on the internet, and I speak of having been to Busan talking to the Africans and the Asians, think that the discussion in Frontier is irrelevant and is missing the point and is ignoring the most important issues of internet governance, which, is, which are based on how do we get the other 5 billion on, not how do we keep the United States government and its friends happy? Now, I don't have time to go deep, but I think that belongs to that. Great, okay, so we have the Emperor without the clues, and yeah. George, you well, want to address that? A, a very quick response to you. What prevents the current taxi drivers from signing up with Uber? Um, the, the response to, uh, to you is it's not an either or question. And you're making it a dichotomy, and it's a false dichotomy. We're doing we're doing both. We're pushing for the ne for the next. By the way, not the next five million, uh, the next three five billion, the next three billion or two billion. Um, we're doing that at the same time that we're moving forward, or that the U.S. companies are moving forward, extending services. Would you argue that we should stop the U.S. companies from moving forward? Most people would. It's called the GAFA argument in Europe. When Facebook oh. comes in and gives you free access, if you go to Facebook, that is not promoting the internet, that's promoting an international monopoly. When Verizon charges for internet traffic so much that the African yeah. countries feel they're being totally ripped off, and it's a key factor in why the internet costs so much in Africa, we don't want to support Verizon's point of view on that if we want to get to the next five billion people. And that's the voice that isn't being heard here. Great, and has been heard now. So thanks for doing that. So Olivier, you, you had a, a response? Well, I was going to make a response to the comment about Uber. Um, the only thing I would uh, add, say is that, I mean, so uh, I, I mean, this is a contest that is being waged in courts now in the United States. Um, as to whether or not medallion owners in California and in New York are monopolies. Um, and I think, George, you suggest whether or not uh, uh, a, a cabbie can, can just become an Uber person. So crowdsourcing like this ostensibly creates new opportunities, is the argument. Um, 
Though, of course, but the, the, the problem is that um, there are a whole set of other consumer-oriented considerations associated with what Uber does. And there are, you know, and I'm going to sound like a law professor here, and there are conventions in law that are meant to address it. So this is, for me, not about internet governance, but about the industry of taxi and, and livery services. Um, as to whether or not we have talked enough about whether other, the, the other half of the world has gotten the internet, I mean, some of us have talked a bit about it, and, 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 there, and this is a serious concern. I mean, one of the questions that I think um, you, uh, Stefan was interested in or talking about is, is what we would do in the next, what if we could do anything in the next year, what would be a priority? Maybe one of the priorities would be to shift and think about ways in which deployment could be encouraged. But that's a contest that has to be waged in conventional spaces for that resolution, right? Um, legislatures, courts, and, and, and other um, international governance regimes. Great. Um, I'm sensitive to the time, and I'm sensitive to the uh, eagerness for you all to talk with the panelists. And so uh, with that, I suggest that uh, uh, we open those uh, Swiss bottles of wine and uh, uh, <laughs> co-mingle, which is a term of art within the New American Foundation. So thank you very much. And, uh,